These men are some of the very few North Koreans ever allowed to leave the country. They're part of a global workforce, exploited by their own country to make money for the regime. They work in appalling conditions, and after Kim Jong-un takes his cut, they're left with little money to show for their hard labor. Solid numbers are hard to come by when dealing with the secretive Kim regime, but according to the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, there are at least 60,000 workers in 20 countries around the world. There are approximately 29,000 in Russia and 19,000 in China. The rest are in other parts of Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. The difference between the exploitation of workers by criminal organizations and the Kim regime in North Korea is that the Kim regime is a criminal organization masquerading as a nation state. Greg Scarlatiu, the executive director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, has testified in front of Congress about this issue. The regime selects male candidates of Good Songbun, North Korea's loyalty-based social discrimination system, married with at least one child. They are on the fringes of the so-called core class, loyal but poor. Of course, the families are kept at home as hostages as insurance to make sure that these workers do not defect. This undercover footage, taken in Russia in 2015 and in Mongolia in 2017, gives us a rare glimpse at how these workers live. North Korea Reform Radio, an activist organization that broadcasts from Seoul into the North, shared the footage from Russia with the Washington Post and South Korean media outlets. The footage from Mongolia has never been seen before now. For the safety of the people in the video, the Post has decided to disguise voices, faces, and uniforms, and not release the exact location of the work site. Kim Song Chol is the founder of North Korea Reform Radio. Born in the city of Ham Hung, along North Korea's east coast, he escaped from a worksite in Russia and defected to South Korea in the early 90s. In the 60s, North Korea sent logging crews to Russia in exchange for military know-how and technology. Under the country's current leader, Kim Jong-un, the program has grown significantly. Conservative estimates put the yearly take at $200 million. Other estimates put the number much higher, soaring into the billions. Jay Koo is the director of the U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Whether they are in the restaurant business or construction business, a large portion, uh, somewhere between 70 to 90 percent of their monthly salary will go to their managers, which will then go directly to the state coffers. They're not allowed to go travel outside of their uh, dormitory complexes. But I think that's case by case because I've also heard defector stories that they are allowed to go out to, you know, limited sightseeing areas, but they are still very tightly controlled by the managers. Hmm? Many workers sign up to go overseas, offering insight into what North Koreans face inside the totalitarian state.
첫 해에는 이제 일을 배우지 못하고 이제 어려워서 그 다음에 나올 때 이제 레물 받친 거 비행기표 이런 빚이 있어서 첫 해는 돈못 버는데 그래도 좀한 1, 2년 지나면 그래도 돈 벌거든요. This ledger book from the worksite in Russia shows how the on-site managers kept track of earnings and even how they kept order. Controlling the workers is possible only by fines, not by monitoring. Workers pay attention only when you talk about their money in the pocket. In July, Kim took this footage in Mongolia. Well, it's Mongolia, so they say that. They say that they don't have money. 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 And this was before the UN passed tough new sanctions that took aim directly at the overseas workforce. As Kim Jong-un continues with nuclear and ballistic missile tests, North Korea's few remaining allies, especially China, are losing patience. Some countries, like Poland, a member of the European Union, say they will no longer issue work visas to North Koreans. But there's no guarantee that the new sanctions will put an end to the overseas worker program. It's like the whack-a-mole game. As we whack them once, they will just dig another opportunity somewhere and emerge. Although unprecedented, the new sanctions do not completely ban the program. Both Russia and China have condemned Kim's nuclear ambitions, but neither country wants a total collapse of the North Korean economy. They have their own independent interest, which is to maintain good relations uh, with North Korea, in which they've uh, had a historically long relationship. The compromise they reached with the U.S. allows some instances in which North Koreans are allowed to work overseas, including for humanitarian purposes. Now, of course, the potential for loopholes is still there. Humanitarian goals uh, is, is a fairly loose term, I guess, and uh, basically making that determination could be a highly discretionary act. The UN and US have addressed North Korean human rights abuses in the past, but Scarlatiu says that the sanctions targeting the workforce are strictly aimed at curbing the regime's advancement of its nuclear program. There is no human rights rationale included in these UN Security Council resolutions. Given what we know about North Korean uh, culture, political culture, and their fear of outside information, my fear is that once these people return, what kind of monitoring, surveillance will they go under? They have certainly sensed freedom, seen things that they probably did not see in their country. If that becomes an issue, what will the regime decide to do with these tens of thousands of workers who came back?